de recerca InfoEx, que avui va a cargo del doctor David Block, que es investigador y creador del Departamento de Humanidades de la nuestra universidad. El doctor Block, que abans, anteriormente, antes de incorporarse como profesor y creador a UPF, había estado profesor y creador a la Universidad de Lleida, porta una larga eh, trayectoria en recerca en sociolingüística, había trabajado diversos años a la Universidad Institute of Education, University of London, había estado, abans de eso, eh, en defensa eh, de docencia de lengua extranjera aquí en Barcelona, y la seva recerca se centra principalmente en la, digamos, la sociolingüística eh, ampliamente entesa en el sentido de la relación a diversas cosas de la lingüística, una de las cuales nos explicará hoy, a temas de sociedad como pueden ser la economía, porque la economía entesa como eh, manera organizativa de la sociedad. Y el tema específico del cual hablará hoy es, um, una mica, para hacernos entender mejor, cómo se entienden uh, las palabras clave, keywords, y qué es lo que ve a la verdadera de nuestro uso, los keywords. Y me parece que, eh, espero que también te esperen uh, okay. en nombre del grupo, que aquí tenemos al coordinador del grupo, el doctor Cormier, y otros miembros del grupo aquí presentes, y, y unos cuantos también a través de, de la conexión Zoom. Bienvenidos y gracias por aceptar la invitación. Muchas gracias. Y, so I, I guess I'll, I'll do this in English because it was advertised in English, is that right? Ah, uh -huh. I could have talked in English. I actually do speak English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the description. I just thought I'd reproduce that and tell you that more or less that's what I'm going to do. Uh, this started from some correspondence with Blanca. Uh, I don't know why I said, well, maybe I could do something <laughs> For this group, you know, do a talk, uh, thinking, it, think of it as an experiment, right? So what I'm going to do is take you through my own thinking. So I've gone back to what is lexicography? What do I understand lexicography to be? Then make the point that I'm not a lexicographer, very obviously, but possibly some of the things I engage in are not that dissimilar. We could probably establish a parallelism, maybe, and maybe not. That's part of the talk. We'll see what, what happens. So. Um, working before. If not, I'll have to sit here. That's strange. I never seen that before. I tried it earlier and it was working. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to go through some very basic stuff. You can correct me if I'm wrong, right? But I, I started looking around, and like I said, I saw this as kind of an experiment. I'm going to, you know, get into this field just a little bit, just to try to understand some things, and then, as I said, try to establish some parallels. So this is Bloomsbury Handbook of Lexicography, the opening chapter by Jackson, talking about lexicography understood in two senses. One is the compilation of dictionaries, and the other is the actual study of dictionaries. So one is kind of more meta. Dictionaries. Uh, when I first started thinking about lexicography, I was more interested in like the how people go through the process of putting you know words with meanings right in the, in the writing of the dictionary, which again is assumed in this. You can't do any of this if you don't have that process. But I suppose that's the part of the process I'm interested in: the meaning of words, how to decide. Um, there's also a reference in the chapter by Jackson about meta lexicographers, and he just goes through different things that people do who are called lexicographers. I do you engage in these practices? Does this look like what you do pretty much? Yeah. Do you have that word? I thought that was an interesting word. <laughs> See, I would put a hyphen there, but anyway. <laughs> so so e-lexicography, right? That's uh, using new technologies or well, not so new technologies, but, but all of this. So I can, I can read this, I understand. It makes a lot of sense. That's what people would be doing. 
dictionaries. Now, this is kind of where I come in because I, I could find some things I could relate to much more directly, looking like in sociolinguistics, uh, for example. Uh, so words do not have meanings, meanings have words. You have socios, arbitrary uh, and then you have, of course, Firth's work on the contextual school. So this, you know, I'm a long time ago having read about these things. They're very foundational, but people move on and no longer cite these sources sometimes. But certainly in sociolinguistics, you know, a word meaning can only be fully appreciated in context. That's what's so basic to sociolinguistics. It's not worth mentioning. And as Firth put it, the company a word keeps, which is an interesting image. Um, now, to me, this means a dictionary entry is always out of context, which is a challenge to both lexicographers and dictionary users, right? So in a sense, you could argue that it's on paper or online or whatever, but it's sort of fixed momentarily, be changed next year, whatever. But still, it's fixed. And therefore, as uses of words go on, the meanings evolve. So it's a very difficult uh, practice, really. Um, I will say, though, the other side of it is people, want, people like dictionaries, and people will always read dictionaries. So you have this kind of tension around that. Um, so there's a kind of lexicographer's perspective is this. The meaning must be transferred from context to the dictionary using a meta language that's sufficiently clear to the user. On the other hand, for the user, the challenge is to transfer the meaning from the dictionary out of that, right? And this may mean transmodality, like moving from written to spoken discourse or from written to image or something like that. And of course, the old distinction between uh, denotation and connotation. Um, so you have you know, associated dictionary meaning, precision, literalness, moving towards fixing the sign, right? And then connotation about the positive and negative emotions, meanings associated with a particular sign. I also link this to what I understand from Holland et al. This is interesting work on this idea of the imagined world. So words very often associated with bigger mental models, if you like, that would be another term we could use, or imagined worlds that we have. So this kind of socially and culturally constructed realms of interpretation that we kind of acquire as we go through life. So words are embedded into this, very obviously. So we're once again back to the, the whole notion of context, which comes up here. And the context could be economic, political, social, cultural, geographical, et cetera. And of course, in all of this is the ever-evolving, the more centrifugal in nature, moving outward from looking at connotations. So maybe denotation moving in and connotation moving back. So where do I come in is, is in this dual practice. You know, you, you're trying to fix a meaning of a word. And the sort of things I do, and the reason why I thought I might be able to, to put this together today is I have a tendency to introduce a term and I'll say that is, and then give a short definition. So a lot of people don't do that. And I'm wondering if it also creates a very kind of heavy style because it you know, makes sentences much longer uh, or just an entire section. You know, before I go on, let me clarify two or three points about you know, what the terms I'm using. So if I'm using something like neoliberalism, I'll say what it is. I don't just throw it out. But most things I read don't do that. So, uh, you know, maybe it's a stylistic question, but also to my mind, very often, because people don't do that, it's sometimes unclear what they mean by the terms they're using. And they come to be catch-alls for a lot of other things that have seemingly have nothing to do with the term. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Now, Raymond Williams comes into this with his notion of keywords, and she famously defined um, as sort of significant indicative words and certain forms of thought binding and certain activities and in interpretation. Williams is not the easiest person to read, actually. So you get, you know, a lot of his, a lot of times with the definition from him, I'll try to sort of reword what he's talking about. And here you get another one talking about the emphasis on my analysis is literally social and historical. And that's a key element here. Of course, Williams' background was in Marxism, Marxist thought. So this whole idea of historicizing words. He wasn't so much interested in etymology, but he was interested in the history of words. So just three points here. Um, the idea it's not the key words are frequently used or are ubiquitous, a phenomenon that corpus linguistics can capture, but they are also by a certain mystery as regards their exact meanings and exactly how they're simultaneously constituted by the constituted by the material world. So they help us construct the world around us, but of course the world around us is constantly impacting on how we actually understand and use these words. 
And of course, that means the words change their meanings. This is from Marnie Holborough, writing from kind of different perspective, but saying that words change their meanings over time in relation to changing social, economic, political pressures. So all this is kind of obvious, but it's, it's, not, it's kind of worth going back over just to kind of set the basis of what I'm talking about. And then the keywords are associated with other keywords. This is a key notion in, in Raymond Williams' work. Enmeshed in mental models. Again, we imagine worlds I was mentioning earlier, mental models. And again, so we don't look at these words in isolation. We look at them with regard to other keywords. And in addition to that, they're embedded in mental models or imagined worlds that we acquire. So ways of understanding. Couple of points on methodology, and you know, I, I say this rather tentatively. Is this what I'm doing in some way? Is the whole notion of eminent critique, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but this comes through Marx and Engels into, above all, critical theory. Adorno, for example, is often associated with eminent critique. This is a definition by my former colleague John O'Regan, and um, again, just to understand things, it's really it's about taking the text, understanding a text. And understanding words in the text in, term of, in terms of the internal logic, not coming at the text with all of these ideas from the outside. Well, that's inevitable to some extent. But trying to analyze and understand the text by looking at the internal logic side. So this means, um, in a way, taking the text and holding up a mirror to the text. Right? Here's the text, here's the mirror. So you understand the text in terms of what the text gives you. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, Eminent critique, there are, there are kind of light forms of this. This is, we could see this is what goes on when people uh, quote a politician, for example, play back to a politician something they've said. Yeah, so, so this is where you're reasoning through this. And the politician, if they're there, have to respond to that, what they said previously. Or if they're not there, it could be a way of even ridiculing someone. And you see this on television, uh, such as, uh, what's that uh, program? Uh, on channel, it's just on the sixth, uh, uh, Wyoming, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So you, so, you take what people say and you play it back, right? This is also done by a lot of YouTubers nowadays, so, so it's often done to ridicule somebody who doesn't you don't agree with. Right? Other person, another person to look at, and this is, I think, the anniversary two years ago, Julio Anguita died. Julio Anguita was a very interesting person discursively, if you ever saw him speak, uh, because he used imminent critique. As a good Marxist, he, he would usually he would let people talk, and he'd always have this thing where he'd say, Vamos a ver. Like, Vamos a ver. Okay. You're saying this. And so he'd kind of play back to the person what they said as a way of creating a conversation with them. Right? And he was very adept. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people, particularly in the latter part of his life, even people who disagreed with him, respected him a great deal. He was very calm. He was able to kind of pull people, pull the ideas out of the person, talk about them feed them back to the person. So this is what you're saying. So it's a very powerful way of reasoning. Um, another methodological base, or maybe this is what I'm doing also, is the notion of the black box. Uh, Bruno Latour has had a very long career. Uh, very recently, he's been commenting on all kinds of things, even COVID. Uh, but going back to the 1980s, he was part of a group of scholars who were working in sociology of science. And in 1987, he published his book, Science in Action, which is kind of observations of lab work done by scientists. Um, he also examined scientific publications. And he came with this idea of the black box, which he borrowed from cybernetics. And uh, I, when I first read this, it was probably about 1990 something. And I, was, I thought this was in, incredibly interesting because that, by that time I was reading academic texts and I started to notice how there's this, the way citation works. Very often there's a particular scholar who is considered foundational, and there might be one particular quote that that person's quoted from, one particular work, one particular quote, and that quote is reproduced. And that quote comes to sort of stand for an idea. And that's the whole idea of what's explained here about what the black box, that's, that's, it's in a black box, so to speak, and nobody unpacks it. It just is used as a kind of token to present an idea. And so it occurred to me that what we need is this idea of two modalities. You have the positive modalities lead a statement away from its conditions of production. That's generally what happens in academic discourse. And it's relative to what I do because that's when people just throw out a term and it's almost like you know what I mean. We all know what this means, so I don't have to bother explaining what it means. 
That might not be problematic, depending on what the ensuing discussion does. But sometimes it is because in the ensuing discussion, you say, well, hold on a second, so what is this word? You know, what does it actually mean? Uh, negative modalities would be the very, very kind of hard work of unpacking. Right? And so what Latour has these graphs in the book where he'll take uh, scholar A cites scholar B, and then he goes to the original work, scholar B cited scholar C, D, E, who also cited, and you can sort of do this archeology, span right? go back through, back in time and just see where the original ideas are from. I suspect if we did that a lot, I don't know who would have time to do it. You, you, would, you would probably discover maybe a lot of things that are being presented in the black box and accepted as kind of representing a particular idea. Maybe the original scholar in the bigger context of what they were writing really didn't, certainly didn't write with that intention. And in fact, we might even argue that we, we reinterpret what was said if we looked at the whole package in a different way. But that seldom happens. So again, the idea here is, is this what I'm sort of interested in? In some way, I'm doing this to some extent, so unpacking. Now, an example of the black box in action, um, and this is uh, very fundamental in linguistics, applied linguistics, sociolinguistics, language studies in general. You know? This is a kind of classic um, Chomsky's linguistic theory. What is linguistic theory? This set definition taking from his 1965 book. So it's repeated, this quote just stuck in there. This represents Chomsky and linguistics, at least at that time, right? The paradigm shift that took place in the 50s and 60s from structuralist approaches to generative grammar. And so this is, this is Chomsky, this represents that linguistics. But then comes along Himes with his critique where he throws in the notion of, we can't just look at this ideal speaker uh, we need to look at repertoire in action. We need to look at language in context. We look, need to look at appropriacy and such things. So there's more to language than the kind of linguistic analysis based on syntax above all that Chomsky was talking about. So a lot of people see this as Heinz definitively, you know, sent Chomsky and generative grammar to the dustbin of history with regard to how we understand language. So there are a lot of people I think who kind of take that view to some extent. Um, I would tend to agree, I agree with what I'm just saying here, but my understanding of Chomsky is he never claimed that he was doing anything else. So generative grammarians are not claiming they're doing anything else. There is a kind of scientific or scientism around generative grammar once it became the dominant paradigm in linguistics, in which kind of looking down on approaches. And I have spoken to people who were more in that realm who maybe say, well, sociolinguistics is just all that social stuff, you know, that we're doing real science, we're doing language science. So I don't have much time for that type of mentality, but I will say, I think Chomsky himself, you know, fair enough, this is what we do. So I find it kind of, in kind of interesting how this has become locked in as the kind of debate that never took place. I can't recall if Himes, I think Heinz and Chomsky might have debated in public at some point, but that really doesn't matter. The debate that takes place looking at these two quotes is reproduced, has been reproduced again and again and again. I don't think it's done anymore because like a lot of things that were kind of of their time, it's even, it's kind of been double black box. You know, first it was black box, this, this shows Himes doing this, and now it's even pushed further in the past. So people don't even bother looking at this. Uh, is, any, is anyone familiar with this, what I'm talking about? Does it make sense? Oh. Yeah. I went to graduate school in the United States. Yeah. I was an undergraduate major in the yeah. 70s and yeah. early 80s. And yeah. This was what it was about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, I would say for Chomsky, in, in favor of Chomsky, for me, my reading, when I read a few things about Chomsky and learned something about generative syntax, I found it quite interesting. Uh, but I see this is doing something totally different, uh, but equally interesting. And, you know, there's something going on here. If you like this, you know, maybe is, is he completely right? But I don't think they're necessarily in contradiction. I just think possibly they're doing different things. But they are doing Anyway, that's just an example, really, of something black box that isn't unpacked usually. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, sorry, one more point. The other thing that's kind of a backdrop to this and something to think about, and this, this is for everybody who works in academia. Um, you ever, have you ever been watching television and somebody's talking about a language issue that you think you know something about, and you get increasingly more and more irritated because you're thinking this person talking 
is not a specialist. They haven't done research on the topic and they're just kind of talking off the top of their head about something in a very commonsensical way. Is that just me or do you have that feeling sometimes? I don't know. Okay. So one thing that's been going on for some time is uh, Sigmund Bauman talked about this in the 80s, a kind of shift historically from intellectuals at a time, and intellectuals are understood very broadly, but we might understand academics working in a range of disciplines, from the sciences to the social sciences, the humanities, whatever, uh, having a role as legislators, actually, actually having a great deal of impact on decision making. And then moving to a time where, particularly in some fields, and I think this would apply above all to the social sciences and humanities, except for economics, which we still put in the social sciences, which is not an exception. Uh, moving into being interpreters, you're kind of off doing your work, but you're not in the political game directly in helping, you know, you're not acting as a legislator of ideas. So you kind of push down into the side and in a political angle, professional politicians can selectively take ideas, but you're not actually part of the decision making. So I'm putting this in very simple terms. But again, it's a very interesting book, and in, in, you know, this, this book by Bauman, because he, he charts this whole process. But of course, it occurs to me we even move to a, a third stage, which is really the demise of the intellectual and the crisis among academics as people go to influencers and other social media celebrities for information. And this has been very clear with COVID and how health officials, rightly or wrongly in their decisions, have been vilified. And somehow, you know, there's always conspiracy theories about what's going on. Some things discovered, yeah, this looks like we could have done things differently, but still it's kind of, this is all in bad faith. It's all about making money for pharmaceutical companies, which of course it is at some level, but certainly COVID was a reality and is a reality. And so again, but still, this is where we are. And so you can go online, you can look at, you, you can watch a YouTuber who gets 5 million followers and go through with a few documents and say, uh, for example, in the United States, Anthony Fauci is wrong about everything and he's trying to ruin your life, and et cetera, et cetera. And where does Fauci get? You know, he doesn't get onto YouTube. Um, and so you end up with this things are just being taken that much further away from academics. So we go from legislators to interpreters to marginalized villains or something like that. Not in all cases, but certainly it's a trend in that way. Okay, so this is another backdrop, I think. Uh, to what I'm talking about, because one of the things I'll be mentioning, I mean, there are kind of two ways this works in my case. One is what I said at the beginning, where I'm writing an article or something, and I use a word, and I say, well, I'll explain what it means, right? I'll go into what it means, and maybe if that involves digging, maybe go back and you know, dig up the black box, so to speak, or I'll engage in some imminent critique about the term at some level. Uh, but the other side of it is engaging in terms that are used in let's say society in general. So, I mean, a word like populism, which I'll come to later, um, has an academic existence and a very long one, but it also has a very long social existence. And particularly in the last two or three years, there's been an intensification of uses of it through the media. So politicians, uh, just people commenting on, so politicians, people commenting on politics, maybe you see on television, and the word comes up all the time. It starts getting stretched in a lot of different so I find it quite interesting, this whole working on what I'm talking about from the academic angle, sort of within academia, among academics, but the other side of it is the engagement of what's going on in the world. And as I said earlier, very often people talking, they use these words, I'm thinking, no, 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 you know, can you use that word that way? Well, yes, you obviously can use it that way, but is that the best way to be using it? But you can't talk to a publisher. Right? Okay. So, that's uh, some background. So I'm going to go to three stories. The first story is actually going to be about a word in the social realm. And this is one that, that came up. Uh, oh, I should stay here. So. Um, <laughs> back to my place. Um, this, this is a, a word that came up um, just in the last, well, since 2017, but in particular in 2019. So this is the case of Julieta Golpe de Estado, actually, because this is all taking place mainly in Spanish, right? right. So we, it starts with Javier Zaragoza, who is one of the prosecutors in the trial of 12, the 12 people on trial for events taking place in the autumn of uh, 2017. So this was in 2019. And 
uh, in his closing statement, Saragossa did something that was quite extraordinary. Um, he stepped outside of his remit very clearly um, because the, the accusations went in the direction of sedition. They went in the directions of crimes that are actually in the Spanish Code of Justice. There is no crime called golpe de Estado. And so what he said was this, right? So just, have, just read that. So what he does, very basically, he asserts that what took place with the Golpe de Estado was a coup d'etat. He cites a, a conservative legal scholar who's very well known, and he goes, uh, here's your definition. Right? I find it interesting, this little comment. So it's kind of interesting that he gives his biographical notes, because I think uh, discursively this works in a certain way in the general context of the, the trial. But that's another issue. Um, so I actually saw this live. I was watching and I saw him make the statement. And I kind of thought, hold on a second. I was here. I, you know, and my understanding at that time what a coup d'etat was. So I have to, what I have to do now is start investigating. Right? So first person I go to is Kelson. So he cites Kelson. So let's look at Kelson. And I found this book, which is a book uh, where the definition is given. And this is what Kelson actually wrote. So I've got the English translation. So the principle of legitimacy fails to hold in the case of revolution. This word understood in the most general sense so that it also covers the so-called coup d'etat. So that, I found that interesting. You go from revolution, which is, I guess, a lot of different things, among them a coup d'etat is a revolution. So, yeah. A revolution in this wide sense occurs whenever the legal order of a community is nullified and replaced by a new order in an illegitimate way that is in a way not prescribed by the first order. So, so in a sense, that's what uh, Saragossa said. So fair enough. He, he more or less repeated that definition. This word becomes very interesting. So what does community actually mean? Can um, a secession, an attempt at secession, be called a coup d'etat. That's the, really the big, the big issue in my mind. And so what is this community? How big is, is the community in Catalonia or is the community the Spanish state? What, what are we talking about? So it's not really clear. And even looking in Kelsen's work, it's not clear to me anyway. And I haven't seen that much. Admittedly, I've only consulted one text. But I have been reading other people who talk about Kelsen. Um, and it, it's still not clear, but I'll come back to that. So what is a coup d'etat? So I start going, I said, well, let's go to some definitions. So I, I go to the Oxford English Dictionary, but then I find this. Uh, you know, this is more technical. I'm no, sorry, this is an Oxford reference webpage. It's called Oxford reference, yeah. So it says, in a violent immediate seizure of state power, usually by armed forces, and with the implication of being undemocratic. And then it gives examples. An unsuccessful attempt was made at a coup d'etat in Russia in 1990. The best overview will be found in Edward Lutbach's coup d'etat. So this is a classic book. So what do I do? I go to that book. There it is. And I found a PDF online. So I download the book and start looking for definitions. So I find this one. And he says, a coup d'etat involves different methods by which power can be seized. Part of the Vita Puch, uh, National War of Liberation. Uh, the coup is not assisted by the infantry masses. So, so again, the other side of the elites involved, a small but critical segment of the state apparatus, but they're in the state apparatus. So once again, we go, where is the state? And what happened here? Where is the state? Is it in Madrid or is it here? So what, what are we talking about? To displace the government from its control of their vendor. So again, was this an attempt to displace the government in Madrid from control over Spain? And then it goes on, concise Oxford Dictionary Politics, another book, and then you get the definition of the sudden forcible legal removal of government, usually by a military or some part thereof, and often a prelude to some form of military rule. 
The outcome is unlikely to involve wide ranging changes in social order, means of preempting revolutionary change. Any of this stuff happened in 2017. So I'm thinking, well, I don't remember this being the case. Uh, and I don't remember this. And I don't recall uh, sudden forcible and the military. So again, and I'll get, I'm coming to the end, by the way. I'm not going to go on like this for too long. Uh, but yeah, more mention of military elites. Um, although the possibility of who's not being led by the military, any elite that's part of the state operation. We come back to the state. The state is being mentioned all the time, not community, but state. And again, these publications, we have to look at Kelsen's a legal scholar. He wasn't interested in coup d'etat per se as a socio-political phenomenon. He was interested in the legality of states and how they function. So that, that's a very important point. So I'm thinking, if I want to know about coup d'etat as a political phenomenon, I need to consult sources that are more in the realm of political science. And as Paul and Tiny were mentioned in the previous quote, they have a table from a 2011 article. And again, if you go through this, you start seeing the targets of the coup, the perpetrators, the tactics, and you get a lot of repetition around the military, not always, but around military, uh, something about the existing regime being thrown over, overthrown, government establishment, et cetera. So you just sort of, what, what you're building up here is just sort of a general uh, association of terms here, but that moves us further and further away from uh, Kelsen as used by, by Saragossa. So we have something about an assault and established constitutional, uh, constitutional should be legality, and that existing government, state power, state apparatus carried out by military, or there's a threat of military, or it could be through the political machinations. And then you have actors, the military, elites, politicians, business interests, and this great term, los poderes facticos, right? So the powers that be are de facto power. And we have a response to, who comes in response to widespread grievance that is the status quo. So you, you know you can find maybe there is grievance and there's a threat to, you know, there's a there's some sense of grievance in the secessionist movement, but then some of this other stuff just isn't there. Um, it is interesting that there were sectors of the press trying to talk about the motions of squadra could be brought in as a, as a military force. Right? It's never seemingly never even came close to happening as far as I know. But again. There just wasn't this kind of, you know, they weren't the hallmarks of a, a typical coup that you see not only reported in newspapers when they happen, but also uh, in films and, and other places. But the idea persists. And so, again, you know, I found this uh, by, I forgot his first name, Corey, writing in the Periodico in 2019. And this is, again, right after the trial. So, sort of in the wake of what. Uh, Saragossa was talking about, and basically it goes through and says why what happened here was a, a coup d'etat, but very sort of fashioning anything that went on and bundling it into that, that kind of meaning. So that's one of those publicos. And I, I remember around that time, you know, 2017, I remember a strike of taxi drivers that took place for a week and collapsed the city, and it was actually more violence, I think, during that week than there was across many weeks in the independence movement. And the whole trial, uh, I mean, I have to say, I became very interested in this because I started reading the, the reports that were part of the prosecution and that sort of thing. So it's, it's quite interesting. Um, you don't have to be in favor of independence to do this. You know, you, you, this is something I'm, you know, I just became interested in. Uh, and also just out of the sense of the way words are being used and the way things are being handled. Um, so, if we take all of this thinking, what we end up with are there have been four coups in Spain uh, over the last century, right? So, we have Primo de Rivera, we have Franco, we have Tejero, and we have these guys. <laughs> so, so, we've had four coups in Spain according to this thinking. And this is becoming, you know, something that's sort of settling in as a theory because you turn on the television anytime and people are those little pieces, right? This, um, one of the more interesting uh, voices in political science, I think, and also somebody who writes quite a bit as a, as a public presence is Ignacio Sanchez Cuenca. So he's written in different newspapers. I don't know if you've seen him or maybe on television. 
Um, it's a very interesting uh, intellectual, thought, in my opinion, anyway, but, and what he has to say about any number of issues. And on this issue, he wrote in 2019, just very clearly, no flammable bit of stuff. And so he explains here, this is just a few snippets, just a few pieces from what he wrote. Um, and interesting what he says here at the end, you know, not a question of what happened here is, is not, you know, what happened here is maybe can be considered very serious if you like, but it wasn't a violent attempt to take power. And here's the key in Spain, because this is the where the when people talk about a coup d'etat statement. So what do you do with this? You first might think I have too much time on my hands, you know, that I'm actually taking time to look at all this stuff. Uh, but you know, this this is where you hear this all the time, just repeated and repeated and, and repeated by pundits on television, by particular politicians. And I, I know I've heard it from these six people and I've heard it from lots of other people, right? So it's just repeated again and again and again. And so it comes to be in its own way, it's kind of a, you know, we could take the metaphor of the black box again, but nobody questions it or unpacks it. It's just a whole piece does and that's it. It kind of sticks with that. So it'd be interesting to see how history is written in the future. Uh, but you know, I put here Agatha, are you fair with agnotology? Agnotology is this wonderful term, which means the propagation of ignorance. And uh, this was, uh, I came across this when I started studying uh, about five or six years ago, I started looking at post-truth and issues around post-truth. And this is taken from the world of, of sort of history and sociology of science. Um, and it's looking at how, for example, in, um, well, you see it with COVID, but also you can see it in climate change. And one of the key examples would be smoking and cancer. And so it's all about counter discourses. So you have a scientific community, a lot of research coming out leading in one direction. There's quite a consensus there. And then other people come in and say, oh, no, no, we've got these other people saying it's not happening. But you know, climate, uh, climate change is not a reality. There's no global warming, no such thing. Why? Because these people say, oh, so the scientists can't agree. Uh, which, by the way, if you look into that, you'll find that it's probably about, it's not a 50 50 split, it's more like 98. 2% split. Now, most people don't question who work in environmental scientists, don't question climate change. They just question the exact nature of it or whether how serious it is and what needs to be done and that sort of thing. So this is borne out by surveys of you know, scientific articles. But whatever the case, the agnotology could be applied not only in the realm of scientific debates like environmentalism, but also I think in terms of just picking up terms and throwing them around. Right? And if you have a forum, then it makes it much easier. And so the, the cumulative effect of this is that effectively we have obesity. Right? Um, so that example, um, again, is more in the realm of society, but you can see how I take it, what's going on in society, and then move it into the academic realm, thinking okay, what, what's happening here and what are the sort of specialists, people who actually study these things, political change, uh, how do they conceptualize it? So you start lining things up and say, well, the conclusion I come to anyway is that it doesn't really uh, doesn't work really as a term for what's going on here. There possibly other ways to describe what went on, but that one doesn't seem to work. However, that doesn't prevent it from you know, having a toehold, if you like, among a lot of people. Um, the second one case I want to talk about, the second story is totally different. And it involves something that's completely internal to academia and to academic discourse. And this is this case. Uh, are you familiar with the term language commodification? Anyone? Is that something? No? I'm not surprised, actually. But, uh, so, a lot of people in sociolinguistics who are interested, particularly if you look at English as an example, the way English has become uh, a part of a skill set that's valued in the job market. Yeah, that's really what's going on. But you could talk about it that way. You could say English is, is a valued skill nowadays, much more than ever. Uh, but it's not the only skill that's valued. That's another thing to think about. But English itself appears in advertising for jobs and it's valued. And people talk about it as a valued skill. So you move from that to looking for a technical term and commodification starts to be used. Um, now, my base for this discussion is actually some things I've published where I've discussed this, where I've sort of challenged the use of 
language to modification to modification to language. Right, these disappear in these publications. Um, not a whole lot, but again, then I've given talks, you know, different conferences, not that much. It's not a major interest of mine, but it is something that kind of piqued my interest at one point, much like the previous example, I just was reading and said, well, what's going on here? Um, it also has to do with reading, um, going back 10 or 12 years ago and starting to read a lot of Marxist literature because commodification seems to be based in Marxist thinking. And that's where the problems begin, as I will now explain. So what is language commodification? Well, here's me using it in 2010. So in 2010, I really was written in 2008. Um, I was reading a few things and people use language commodification. And I talked about it as a move from valuing of a particular language which basic communicative function and more emotive associations, national identity, cultural identity, the authentic spirit of people and so on, to evaluating for what it means in a globalized, deregulated, hyper-competitive, post-industrial. I don't know why I did that, but anyway, too many adjectives. New work order in which we now live. So I got a bit too enthusiastic there, but you get the point, right? So uh, other scholars using the term transformation relationship between language and identity. Language is supposed to be a reflection or marker of one's social identity, therefore not something subject to exchange. You move from that to language has lost that association. English has become deeply commodified that this much is undeniable, flat out statement. English is seen as an economic resource, a commodity that can be exchanged in the market for material products. So the definition of commodity here is an economic resource that can be exchanged in the market for material profit. So that's anything that's some sort of exchange. So I'm thinking about that language. What is language anyway? Is that kind of like this, this, this language right here? I mean, what, what is it concretely? So you said, for example, an economic resource, a commodity that can be exchanged in the market for material profit. You could think of an object, like something you might sell, a product. A product can be advertised and people go buy it. And so, so that kind of thing. So that's just a very basic level to look at it. But you know, that we start running into a little bit of an issue of what is language and how does it fit into this. Now, Duchesne and Heller are probably. Monica Heller in particular is one of the, probably the person who first started using this term, going back probably about 20 years ago. Um, and Heller is a, for me, in my eyes, one of the best sociolinguists around, consistently published, very, very high quality work, very rigorous researcher, and very rigorous in her argumentation. She writes very well, et cetera. So I have a great deal of admiration for her work. And I think at the beginning, when I started reading about this commodification stuff, I was like, as you see in the previous quote, I. And I took it on in the same way uh, that she and other people were, were using it. Um, this is a kind of a definition uh, from 2012. So that's Monica Heller and Alexander Duchesne. They collaborate quite a bit. Uh, commodities are, in fact, things that have value. Marx pinpoints the fact that, in the end, the structure of work is determined by the market, by the interplay between useful and exchangeable products, both of which are linked to time, availability of labor, and the consumption of goods. Um, Yes, I mean, that's kind of an interesting way to describe Marxist theories, but I suppose it's not completely in contradiction. But I'm not going to get into exact details. What's key here is the idea that commodities have value, right? And this is what they're going to argue is that languages have value. So you end up with elsewhere, Heller et al. in 2014. Now here they're going to define it in more detail. Commodification is the expression we use to describe how specific object or process is rendered available for conventional exchange of the Although the concept parts back to Marx's idea that capitalism was founded on the notion of turning back, of turning work into a commodity, the word commodification itself is recent, dating from the mid-1970s. So here there's a hint that maybe they're not using it in the same way as Marx would have. So thus, although capitalism is essentially about producing and distributing commodities, and has historically and characteristically expanded the scope of what can be turned into one, so we've changed the idea of what can be commodified, okay? The concept of a nominalized process does not seem to appear, uh, appear until the process affects areas of life through their own treated as public goods. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing, but basically what they're saying, we're going back to the same idea, something like language, even just one language, English language, 
had use value. I'll come to use value in a moment. Basically, we just use language to communicate, and that's that's what it's about. And also, it's identity building. It's related to all kinds of things that have to do with ourselves right? and the way we associate with other people. So there's a social dimension, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? You go from that to somehow there's a, there's an exchange of money, something going on, buying the language, and this is where things get a, get vague. What does that actually mean? As I said five minutes ago, what does it mean? Now, this is where I go into my whole uh, go back and look and see what, you know, what, how can we make sense of this word? So you go back to Adam Smith and David Ricardo. So it's a foundational work, particularly Adam Smith's is Wealth of Nations, foundational text for what's known as political economy. Uh, by the way, Adam Smith did not say, you know, that he wasn't a scholar that said, oh, we leave everything to the market. He wrote about political economy as he defined it. And that is, as it's understood, is about economics, but it's about politics, it's about the social, it's about society, government, everything. And that's what he wrote about. So there is quite a bit that's detailed about economics, but there's a lot of, a lot of the other things going on. Um, Ricardo's a more technical text and highly unreadable, uh, but again, taking some of the ideas from Adam Smith somewhat forward. So what you end up with is Ricardo writes about Smith. Smith wrote about commodities. And in fact, this distinction between a commodity can be for use value, right, where it's something that serves a need that we have. So it's almost kind of an organic approach, you know, it's a, it's a good, but it's not being exchanged. It's just something we might create ourselves, we produce it, and then we use it. Right? Exchange value is when you enter a market and you have produced something and then you exchange it for another object or eventually money. Right? So that's what we get here. And so basically what I've done here is Ricardo writing about Smith and he goes to in technical detail. I'm not going to really dwell on the exact details of all this, but the point I'm trying to make is I go back, I pull this up, and I'm looking at people writing about this, first of all, centuries ago. And again, they're, they're talking about this distinction between value of exchange and use value. So th these terms actually existed a long time ago. Um, and of course, when they're doing this, they're not thinking about, they're thinking about the early days of industrialization. So the production of some sort of product, not language. Right? We'll be thinking about that. Now, Marx comes along and Marx is significant because political economy existed. He elaborates a critique of political economy and in his own way, um, creates some sort of alternative view, if you like, but I, I did put these up here. I know this is a lot of text, but you have this idea that commodities have a dual nature. He talks about them as having use value, which again is what we use things for, but also have exchange value because we live in a capitalist society and there's a market exchanging commodities. And of course, what we end up with money for commodities. Um, and what he, I mean, one of it, Marx's interesting theories is what he was really interested in what's behind the commodity. So you have the notion of there are human beings producing the commodity that's sold in the market. And this is what gets left out. The commodity goes to the market and it's just an object. But behind that, there's what's known as the labor power, and the labor time that went into producing it. And then we can start getting into differentials between what something is sold for and what the worker is paid to produce it. And we all know what that's about. You end up with notions of exploitation, for example, the concept of exploitation. So all of this is fundamental to a theory of capitalism from a Marxist point of view. The only reason why I put this up here is that what it shows is Marx is really concerned with, again, what is behind the commodity. You know, he talks about uh, the exchange relation is characterized by its abstraction from the use value. So the use value is pushed to the side in the market. It's just the object, as I said, that's being sold and money is exchanged. But it, it's abstracting away from the original production. And that's what human beings, that, I mean, this is where Marx in a way is a humanist because he's, he's interested in the human condition and these workers producing this and getting paid very little for it. So again, we abstract also from material constituents of forms which make its use value. So again, the use value is supposed to sign, we have exchange value. And, you know, he uses terms like sensuous characteristics. So again, I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but. Again, he's 
again, he's humanizing this whole process. The humanizing side is what's getting pushed in the background. And it's only a matter of exchange of an object, commodity, and uh, money. And he introduces the notion of congealed labor, which again, is somehow the commodity contains congealed labor. There's labor in it, but it's just not seen. And the term fetishization is used. The fetish is when everything is hidden from us. It's mysterious, a mysterious commodity. The mind just appears there, and the economist doesn't look at what went into the production, only that their production costs, but beyond that doesn't look at the human condition and just looks at the product going to the market and exchange. So again, there's a turning point as we go through the 19th century of economics emerging as a discipline where it's about the technical aspects of capitalism and how it works, how the market works. And that's going to continue to this day. Uh, but going back to this, we have this Marxist theory coming through. My, my main point in showing this really is just to show we have Marx thinking about this in a particular way. And so in the modern time, you know, in, in the present, when people are using the term, they make reference to Marx, but do they have they actually gone back and thought about how Marx would conceptualize it? And importantly, whether language can be uh, can be used as a commodity. It, sorry, whether language can be referred to as a commodity. So this leads me to questions. So for example, if Marx knows commodities are products of labor, what is the labor constructing the language? Right? So Marx is looking at a factory, for example, looking at workers in a factory, looking at production, looking at labor time, right? Um, what, what is going on with language? What is, how is language, what is the work? What is, what is actual labor going on to produce the language? What is the congenial labor time of languages? Again, the same question stated in a slightly different way. Where is this congenial labor where language is produced? There's labor behind it somewhere? What is this? How does it look? If the exchange value of the commodity is linked to the cost of its production, what is the cost of production of language? Right? So what does it cost to produce language? You could say, what does it cost to produce an automobile? You could probably go back and look at all the processes and put that together. Right? But what does it cost to produce language? And then my it occurs to me, are we talking about an instance of language use? Because a lot of this work is looking at languages being used in contexts such as call centers, right? So you telephone your bank, you're not talking to the bank around the corner. You're talking to, if you're doing it in Spanish, it'd be somebody in, in Morocco. If you were doing it in English, it'd be somebody in Pakistan, you're coming from London, et cetera. So people working in those centers work under, this has been studied quite a bit by sociologists of labor, but also a lot of people working in language because language is being used. So I did language labor. And the whole job is about speaking from the telephone. So apart from that, you have scripts, you have information at your disposal that you use when you answer people's questions about their particular bank. Right? So in that moment, you represent <laughs> the bank in the UK and you are answering questions about it. So people working in the bank in the UK are not dealing with this. Right? This is outsourcing. Of that particular service. That's been going on for 30 or 40 years now. So again, a lot of interest people working in language in that because what they're saying is people working in those centers are being paid to use language. So we have at some level kind of an economics of language use and also what they would like to say is that language is commodified, right? It's, it's, a, it's a force of labor. If you want. But it becomes very difficult to kind of break that down what it actually means. So does that mean a greeting? One chunk of language, like a greeting, is something that could be calculated as costing a certain amount of money or a certain amount of effort on the part of the person producing it, or a warning, an explanation. When we talk about language in its entirety, you just arrive and say, I'm an English speaker. And that's where the exchange of money takes place. Or are we talking about more concrete products, such as a translated manuscript? Well, that makes a little bit more sense. If that's a language product, if you like, a translated manuscript, it seems easier to kind of say, well, this has a price, you pay for it. And you might even say there's labor. You could say very easily there's labor behind that, there's labor put into doing the translation. That can be calculated as sort of effort on, on the one hand, expertise supply, and then time use. But in the case of an instance of language use or a chunk of language, how do we grasp the labor time? You know, what, what is you know this whole thing? So I think I'm not going to go off, but you can kind of see where I'm going with this. You know, we're talking, we talk about language as a skill in a more general way when we talk about commodification. We're just saying that people need English to work in the call center. 
And if your English is considered to be good enough, you work in the call center and that's it. So what happens, I go beyond that, and uh, I'm just gonna skip through these fairly quickly. But I start looking at other scholars, people I've actually worked with, like Marty Holberg, and others I know but haven't worked with. And um, again, they're coming at it from the same angle and just questioning this whole issue of labor power with regard to language. But I think the point that's made here that's kind of interesting is how do you sort of, you know, people go for a job interview, they have a list of skills they're expected, and language might be one of them. You have to speak English, right? But there's all kinds of other skills you have to have. You have to be able to organize information. You might have to use certain types of software. So there, there's like a whole list of skills you need to have. You know, man time management, that sort of thing. All of this tends to come together. In a working day, you are doing all of these different things. So it becomes difficult in some way to abstract out language because you're using language to do some of these things. So where is this, this kind of separation of language as a separate commodity, which seems to be implied in a lot of this research? And so you see people are asked literacy, numeracy, dexterity. These are the skills that are people. And this is kind of the labor power a person brings to the job. And language is, is in there somewhere. It's part of all of this. But to take it as separate somehow seems a bit strange. And again, Ken McGill makes a similar point. He's talking about call center work. And he talks about how it's achieved. Um, you know, you, you're actually using quite a few different skills. You know. And he wants to focus on the broader issue of alienation when it comes to working jobs like that. Uh, and the other one is this fetishization argument I said earlier. Uh, so you exclude from the discussion any consideration of concrete labor that produces value and commodities necessary. Commodities. So what, what's happening here is th these scholars are actually going deep into Marxist theory because they've seen the word commodity and commodification. So they will fair enough, that's where this comes from. So I'm going to see this is what. Marx says, this is what other scholars say drawing on Marxism. And how does that line up with how people are using it? So, so one thing I did, which I included this way, by the way, like a lot of things. Um, the, this is from 2019 publication, but you know, having read a fairly sizable sample of publications in which language commodification figures prominently, I've come to the conclusion that many researchers are using commodity not in a Marxist sense, but in the prosaic sense of something that can be bought and sold, adding that that something was previously treated as not sellable and was not actually sold. In this case, commodification is simply the process of something not previously sold becoming sellable. I'll just repeat it anyway. But is this really right? Is it enough? I think it's neither, especially when so many also really do not even attempt to define it. Treating as something like, uh, you know what I mean. This is what I said earlier. Kind of thing. So, not digging it up. Now, this is terribly boring. And I have actually spoken to people, uh, some of the people I've cited, people, a lot of people use language commodification. And I found just in general, just a total lack of interest in uh, any kind of questioning of this. Like, so what? Um, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter at all. Maybe it really doesn't matter. And what's interesting, I go back to Monica Heller, for example, everything I read by her, I find extremely interesting. So I, I just ignore the qualification terminology and just sort of cut to what she's actually finding about language practices in society. And I find that, as I said, very interesting. So maybe it doesn't matter. But I does kind of, you know, I kind of think, well, it doesn't matter what terms we use in a way, or the terms start to be used, they take on a life of their own. And in a sense, they become black box. People don't have to unpack them because everybody knows what everybody means. And uh, I will say that it's not just in language studies, because I've also noticed, you know, kind of my antenna is up, but I'm looking at something more in the realm of sociology, it's commodification is also used. And so in a, in a fairly similar way. But I think in the case of language, it becomes problematic because of this difficulty of defining what we mean by language that is commodified and sort of pulling language apart. It's just, like I said, is it phrases? Is it actual document produced? What, what are we actually talking about? Okay, so we come to the third element here, and I'll, I'll go through this one fairly quickly. Um, this is the, we talked about coup d'etat as coming more from society in general. I've talked about the, the whole issue of language commodification, which is much more sort of 
internal to academia kind of debate like that, and a very, very specific one. And I, would, I dare say, not particularly interesting to most people, like the whole internet modification, who cares? But, you know, again, it ties in with the general theme I'm talking about, which is unpacking, you know, looking at the way terms are used and unpacking. Also, it would be like I'd like to think if I'm going to use the term, how, you know, that's what got me started. I was using language modification. And then when I was reading more Marxist literature, I was led back to sort of question how I was using it. And that led me to question how other people use it. So it's kind of that process going on. This is a, an interesting case because we have a term that's used in the social realm very much, going back to the whole notion of, you know, the tertulias and any kind of public debate. You see it in, you know, among politicians, you know, populism here, populism there. Everybody's talking about populism. So it's become one of the most uh, uttered uh, keywords in recent times. There's a long history of populism in, in political literature, going back. Um, the emphases have changed over time. Uh, this um, is a quote from a fairly recent article by these authors. And uh, you know, recent political events have brought the word populism to the center of discussions across the globe. They're making headlines, way of policymakers, pundits. So everybody's getting involved. Everybody's talking about populism. Now, uses in the real world. Then here we get into uh, again something I'm quite interested in. I mentioned earlier this whole kind of mediatized world of political discourse. So this could be YouTubers. It could be. Uh, through the social media, Twitter, I mean, just everything's going on around. It's kind of information overload that we live in constantly, the info sphere that we live in. And so we have, you know, this, this, this word populist, which is uh, being done. It's very often used in the intention of discrediting the person in front of you. Now, another word that was used for a while was demagogia. You know, I remember watching, you know, just actually five years ago, you'd be watching two people arguing on a, in a tertulia, and, and suddenly one would say, you know, oh. <laughs> and, that was, and very often you kind of wonder what that, I never understood what the word meant. You know, I thought I knew what it meant, but then when I started seeing it used in all these events, it seemed to me, I disagree with you, but I don't really have any arguments, so I'll just say you're in demagogy. Uh, so populist also has that kind of ring to it. You know, somebody says something, so that's really populist. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. So again, it's an insult word. Um, discredit the person, and it's still an auto-ascribed. It tends to refer to what others did. You're a populist, I'm not. Although what you have here uh, is quite different, but. And further to this populist often reified or thingified is something embodied in politicians. So we talk about a politician, a populist politician or a populist political party. And this is something what I've realized, my big argument is, I, don't, I wouldn't use populism in that way. I see it in a different way. I don't think it has this absoluteness that you can say a politician is a populist or a party is a populist party. And I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, but again, this is where we are. And of course, populism, look at the history of populism. Um, in the United States, for example, going back a century ago, it was a populist party. It wasn't really with any kind of negative connotation because it's all kind of appeal to the people kind of thing. Uh, and you could argue, particularly in American politics, but in other political systems around the world, there's a constant strand of populism. It's always there. But what does populism mean? Um, you know, we end up, so here I'm digging, you know, I go back and kind of dig up these things. So this is again uh, from the same source I cited earlier. And um, they talk about three different approaches. One is what they call the ideational approach, an ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated, right? Uh, Muda, is a, Muda is cited by, well, Muda is citing himself right here, but Muda is cited by a lot of scholars today, and even I've seen journalists citing him as kind of a, the key specialist on populism or expert on populism. Uh, but I totally disagree with him because he, he calls populism a thin ideology. He says it's an ideology. And I would disagree with that. I don't think it makes it to that stage. I think it's something that cuts through ideologies, different ideologies. But, um, but so much for that. There, but there is an approach that sees populism as ideology. Then another one is to see a political strategic approach, a political strategy through which a personalistic leader seeks to exercise the government power based on direct, unmediated, unsolicited support from large numbers of Muslims. 
Now, this I find interesting. This is where I come in. I, I see this. I, I've sort of I would change the terminology into discursively constructed. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the idea that it's, it's a strategic approach. So it's something like anybody or, or at a given moment in time, any politician can resort to this strategy. And I find that in my thinking and also my observation look more accurate for what's going on. The sociocultural perspective sees populism as fundamentally relationally outside the sociocultural dimension means that populism, the two-way phenomenon essentially defined by the claims articulated the connection established between the leader and supporters. It's about identity creation and identity is more than about world music. So again, this is kind of an identity approach. Um, but I would say that really the, the two that I've seen the most really being discussed at least, one is this kind of more strategic approach and the other one is something more absolute in some ways, an ideological approach. And of course, somewhere around here, you have this notion there are political parties and there are politicians who are populists in an absolute sense all the time. Now, sorry, you know, it doesn't really fit on the page, but um, this is sort of me going back. So keywords are social populism. So I start reading and you know, thinking, okay, well, how can I make sense of populism? What's out there? Right? And so you start putting together key, not, so, not really key words, really key ideas would be a better way to put it, that are associated with uh, populism. And if you go through this, you'll see that you know, you probably see, yeah, I can see that. I think most people could agree that if you look across a range of texts, you're going to find uh, all of these coming up in different forms. Some, some scholars will focus on, um, for example, the idea of emotive and irrational. Some will focus more on the fact it's always about the people and the elites, or some people both focus on both of those ideas. They're not incompatible at all. Um, or the way that optimism very often is backward looking, um, breathing space. So these are kind of key characteristics that come through a range of publications. And of course, there are associations with words like nationalism and authoritarianism, which I'll come to. Um, the other thing I think is uh, interesting is this, because I, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the times we live in are, the spectacle becomes the most important thing, and this is happening quite a bit in politics. Um, so, um, <laughs> Trump, for example, is a key example there. I think Diaz Ayuso in Madrid is a very interesting example. So you just turn the whole political sphere into just ongoing, just constantly a spectacle. It's just, a, just very interesting, and it's entertaining, and the entertainment value becomes what gets you elected in many cases. You are more entertaining than someone else. This seems to be where we're heading in modern democracies. Uh, so populism fits into this because it's often entertaining, often humor-based, if you will. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. The other thing, yeah, the other thing I was going to say, sorry, is it's also faith-based. One believes in a leader and all else is accessory. This is another kind of dangerous trend I see going on today. You see it with Donald Trump, you see it with Diaz Ayuso progressively in Madrid. And so the idea is that once a politician, you have faith in the politician to do anything. They're not held accountable. Everything is passed through some field of conspiracy theory against them, or simply, oh, leave, you know, well, he or she is doing other things. You know, so why do I care about that? So that seems another way we're going in populism. Also, sorry, I meant to say this. There are different types of populism or strategies, probably strategies apply to health, economics, anti-terrorist populism. So, for example, in debates in Spain, when somebody brings up, uh, just by saying Bildu, uh, sort of conjuring up ETA and everything. So you end up with this kind of anti-terrorist populism. You know, the people, you know, we the people, you know, they're these terrorists, they're trying to attack us, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is uh, interesting. Economic populism, you can see very clearly in, in certain economic policies. And health populism, we saw around the COVID pandemic, where people were, again, instrumentalizing and weaponizing uh, we were in a pandemic or political gain by playing off the whole thing of health versus economy. Now, these three terms seem to go together quite a lot. It's another thing I've discovered is that populism very often associated with authoritarianism and nationalism. Um, there's a paper I haven't written and I need to write, and it's, it's a case study 
um, around the party uh, Ciudadanos, and it has a very, um, it goes through stages, if you like. And you look at the development of the political party, first it's just an association as a political party in Catalonia, and then going statewide in Spain, and then crucial bad decisions in the party going down, and now where it is at present. Um, but one of the things that occurred to me was despite, it, it's an interesting example, and I've got lots of quotes and you know, different examples there, but you move from uh, a, a self-definition of not being any of these things to taking on characteristics. So becoming more authoritarian, more, more and more populist uh, strategies being used, and becoming more and more nationalist, in the case Spanish, Spanish nationalists are coming through. And over a period, a short period of time, the party has this huge transformation in that direction, which leads to its uh, demise. Right? So again, I mention that because uh, and I don't have time to go through the case, but I have another presentation on that, so I'll, some other time. But this, uh, this, this kind of showing how the keywords kind of overlap. And a lot of the literature coming out about populism is more about authoritarianism might be the central idea, but they end up talking about populism and nationalism. So there seems to be a cluster around these three keywords. I think that's worth mentioning, apart from everything else I said earlier about associated ideas. Now, I mentioned this thing about discursive strategy and just to see where this is coming from. Um, and this is actually, um, actually waiting for the result of a proposal for a project about populism, just taking populism as a keyword and following it in different scenarios uh, with the uh, Banco de Bilbao funding. So the, the decision will be soon, right? And it no doubt be negative, I guess, but anyway. Uh, but anyway, there's a proposal put in, I put in recently with a colleague. And so the idea was uh, looking at these sorts of things. So having a methodology around critical discourse analysis. Uh, so I won't go into detail about that. And also looking at this notion, starting with Laclau and Mouf, who had this idea of this strategic, this, this, this strategic, uh, sorry, a political strategy, populism, shifting that to a discursive strategy, if you like. And, uh, and again, just repeating some of the ideas from earlier. This just repeats some of the ideas. But this, this kind of approach of saying, well, it's through the discourse being produced by politicians that we can see the populism. But to say that, populist, that as I said earlier, the, the, the politician is always populist becomes uh, problematic because there, there could be times when the discourse doesn't go in that direction. And any politician, probably at some point or another, is appealing to possibly anti elitism or certainly to the people, because all they're often appealing to the people. And this is what critical discourse analysis provides. And then here, another methodological issue is much of the telling case. So what do you actually focus on? You might have noticed that I tend to focus on, I'll just take one thing, I mentioned Steve Adanos as a, as a party, focused on their trajectory to explore the whole notion of populism. So what I tend to do is I'll just identify in politics and society at large, a particular set of circumstances or a particular sequence of episodes composing kind of a unit. So there's a debate about something over a period of five months and then it disappears, that sort of thing. So you take that period of time and you look at the media and you look at any number of sources of data and just see how the case fells out. This is from uh, the work of Mitchell, uh, famously talked about a telling case. So you're not looking at typicality. You're not in the realm of saying, I'm gonna, you know, it's not like conducting a survey uh, using uh, statistical analysis and try to make general statements. You're taking, you're specifically going to something that actually sticks out as a very, very interesting case through which you can make general statements, but certainly the case itself is very specific, right? that it's saving. So that's kind of where I'm looking at populism. Now, so what? I'm at the end, sorry. I was somewhat of an abrupt end. I ran out of energy. So um, I've looked at the three cases. You know, uh, the populism one, there's, a, there's more to that, as you probably gathered, but I'll, I'll just cut that off. But the idea, as you can see, is say, well, I can, you know, what I'm actually doing, what is it? You know, I'm just taking a keyword and I'm just digging, you know, trying to find an academic text definition. So it might be the case of something sort of out there in society, uh, collecting examples from television programs or YouTubers or whatever, and putting that together to, to construct kind of a, a telling case to, to kind of a specific set of episodes around the term. Um, am I a lexicographer by other means and outcomes? You know, so am I kind of doing 
the background work of lexicography of trying to find word meaning, of being sensitive uh, to this whole thing, being engaged in meaning word tension, the whole tension between meaning and word and the importance of context as part of what I'm doing. So in that sense, do I share something with people who go through the whole process from zero to the end product of the dictionary? Also, I'm fighting battles of denotation and connotation because I'm kind of back and forth. In a way, I'm saying there is a fixed meaning I can find for these terms. But on the other hand, I'm aware the meaning is subject to all kinds of forces, if you want. So we come to the realm of connotation. Uh, the whole notion from first, you know, we're first talking about look at the company of word keys. I also follow Williams' cultural Marxism investigation of the historically situated keywords in their meaning. So this idea that keywords are very much of a particular time or over a period of time, as Marty Homer pointed out in one of the slides, there will be a change. Meanings can change over time. And that's also another way to look at it. And I do some form of imminent critique and I open black boxes. So that's what I've been trying to, to show to the extent. But who ultimately decides what uh, keywords actually mean? And that's kind of takes us back to whether anybody actually uh, pays much attention to these sort of things, if you like. Um, as I said in the whole day about the whole debate about commodification of language, I don't, you know, I think that's kind of died. There was a period of time. Uh, there was one person or a response to people who were criticizing the use of commodification, but it doesn't really go anywhere. To be honest, myself, I'm not, it's not a topic I want to pick up and you know, make a career out of, uh, you know, analyzing it. Just something that came up in the course of doing other things. Uh, but whatever the case, you know, who decides what a keyword, like language commodification, who decides what it means, and means in the sense of it's out there being used and it continues to be used. So any criticisms in a way are kind of pushed to the side and people remain in a kind of silo using the term. This happens a lot in academia, probably more than it should. So thank you, and that's it. I'm going to end right there. Uh, what I don't know is if some of the things here, if you wanted to discuss some of them in more detail, and that's what I was going to leave open. So, okay, so thank you. Thank you. I'm going to see Si participas en la ya, diré en la cámara y ahí podría ser para aquí para el templo. Es una otra opción. Yes, Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Muchas gracias por por esta charla tan interesante. Uh, podem fer preguntes, comentaris, tant en anglès, català, imagino que fer castellà. I... I per el xat. I per el xat. Si algú vol dir... I ara... Per a l'hora estiu, perquè jo no... Ara per l'hora estiu. No tinc accés al que és el xat. Després jo tinc una pregunta a fer jo, però faré l'últim perquè... No, no, només els que em sentiu des de casa, que si teniu preguntes us podeu fer pel xat o bé simplement a seguir la mà, també. Algú aquí primer? I have a lot. By the way, by the way, I mean, just to make clear, I... I approach this as kind of a, kind of a thought experiment. Uh -huh. uh, I said, what, what can I say that might be uh -huh. Sí, uh, sí. 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 I'll speak in English since your talk was in English. Uh, the first thing is just a very small point because I, I was, uh, obviously I'm American and I was studying uh, linguistics at 
the time when Chomsky was particularly dismissive of everyone and anyone who was not interested in the ideal speaker here. Um, I was studying at Georgetown University, which had a lot of professors who were associated with the Center for Applied Linguistics. And he basically would say that what they were interested in was not worth the paper they were writing it on. Mm. He was equally dismissive of people in interpretive semantics. Mm. Um, and so it's true that he, you know, he says, this is what I want to do, and here's how I think it should be done. But he he and several of his followers were particularly um, well, I'll say not nice yeah. to other approaches to language saying that they were intellectually inferior among other mm -hmm. things so i mean and that was very pervasive in the united states in the 1970s the second the, a, an overall question i have is as someone who i'd like to think has studied the lexicon a lot i see word meaning we talk about word meaning in the singular but the fact is most of the words I use in my daily life in three languages don't have a single meaning, but rather have a range of meanings. So someone you would be, I think, very interested in reading is someone like Patrick Hanks, who has uh, an approach to lexical analysis. Hanks was a student of John Sinclair, who was a student of Perth. Um, who that in which context is all important. But the whole idea, and Patrick Hanks is, was, well, has, is still a professional, lex, has been a professional lexicographer for over 50 years. And the, it's someone who has tried to do this for 50 years to assign a very specific meaning to words or specific itemized meanings to words comes to the conclusion that actually that if we want to take a more abstract approach, that's not going to work, I think needs to be considered seriously mm -hmm. because he certainly dealt with enough data to, to come to that conclusion. So one of the questions I have when you talk about um, your use of key words, and I think your example of commodification, which I have a specific comment on, is I think is, I wonder how specific a meaning you think a keyword should have, because my point of view would be mm -hmm. that people from different um, in economics or soci sociological theories would have different definitions and they can coexist at the same time. And it is in fact a problem. One of the problems I think that has occurred with the media technology revolution that we are living in, in which everyone has a platform to say anything and there's literally no editorial filtering of anything or the, <coughs> the editorial filtering there is is so minor that it's inconsequential, is that people, as you say, use words the way they want to, but not necessarily the way a, commu a community would have because community is in fact what dictionaries are about. Dictionaries are about it's about accounting for the lexicon as used by a linguistic community. So any specific use by one person who may be important, but a very specific use that is not shared by the community basically does not belong in a dictionary, which yeah. is a record for mm -hmm. a community. But the, so when you talk about who ultimately decides what mm -hmm. keywords mean, I wonder, do they have to mean just a single yeah. thing? Yeah. Uh, maybe they can mean several things. I'll stop there. Yeah. No, no, I think I think you're right. In fact, <laughs> I, 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 it, it, I said there's kind of tension between denotive meanings, you know, trying to find the exact meaning somehow. Mm -hmm. And yet that's in contradiction with what I understand about how meaning is sort of floating, if you like, and it's evolve, ever evolving, you know, through use, as you said. Um, I'm just reminded of one of the, uh, one, one response to criticisms of commodification. I, I, there was Ken McGill, I had a quote by him, and he was referred to as working in a literalist way, that he seemed to be wanting a strict meaning for a commodity, and because he wasn't finding it in uh, all of this sociolinguistic literature using it, he was critical of it. Um, and, um, and it seemed a bit odd because then the person made reference to metaphor, 
and um, and said that people were using this metaphorically. So you know that that's that's kind of a that's an interesting discursive move you know, uh, for a lot of reasons. But and then somebody else pointed out, yes, but there are people saying very clearly that they're not using it metaphorically; they're using it as a reality. So you know we get into debates like that. But I, I agree. Um, I, I I I think part of what I'm doing is in a sense, almost wrong by my own standards. You know, I'm trying to find a meaning. Or better said, to be more charitable to myself, I'm just trying to make clear to the reader, to say, I want you to know what I mean by this word, at least my own work. Like I said, the critique of people using other words is not really, I did that with modification, but I'm not gonna, as I said, I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, the, the um, something else that you said. There. But the, what um, I wanted to say yeah. about commodification, what sounded odd to me yeah. was that when I, had to study economics in college many years ago. Um, I always understood commodities as being tangibles, which is why they could be traded on a futures market in Chicago, exactly. as opposed to take well, um, as opposed to something like a skill set, which is I, I, it's not that skill sets don't exist; they do exist. But they're not tangible in the same way yeah. as sunflower oil currently uh, not yeah. being produced in the Ukraine yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. going to be traded on a market and what's going to be the price of that uh, six months from now. So uh, in that sense, it sounded language commodification to me sounded odd because to me, language in many of the examples yeah. you cited was it was language as a skill set, yeah. and I find that hard to classify as a tangible entity. Yeah. And and this this makes the use of it in a way unnecessary or superfluous. It's almost like you're adding a layer of terminology you don't need because you could refer to it as skills. And I think that's part of my motivation because mm -hmm. it refers to uses of other words. And I. I I, I can remember a former colleague of mine used tend to use a lot. You know, she would write very long sentences and put in a lot of adjectives, like neoliberal, for example, and just throw all of these words on the page. And I, I would read it, and, I, and you know, she'd ask me to read stuff she wrote, and I said, "Well, you know, just to get some feedback." And I said, "Well, I think you could just say this in these five yeah. words and you know, these ten words because you're just opening up. You know, it's almost like they're hostages of fortune in themselves because somebody could always ask you." How are you using this combination of adjectives? And uh, I don't think that went down well, but but I think the person thought they were using a lot of technical vocabulary, but to what end, if you like? Mm -hmm. And I and I think a lot of what got me started with commodification, also I can think of a few other words, is kind of how they're used, and it's almost like they themselves become they mystify in a way. Uh, and I'm not a I'm not sort of a, a plain language proponent or anything like that, but I do think that there are points in time when we're writing and putting together an argument that you can make the point much more simply. And very often there's a use of terminology that is just not necessary, just a, another layer, if you like. It's an embellishment that maybe is not necessary. I'm not sure I always apply this myself, to be honest, but, but I, when I see it in other work, I, I, I sometimes think that's what's going on. So I think what motivates me sometimes to go after a word and try to find a meaning that works for me is, is this, that I, I say, well, it's being used a lot of different ways. It doesn't really make sense, you know, what, you know, it just mean uh, neoliberal is an interesting example as an adjective because it's used a lot of times with just what I don't like. What I don't like is neoliberal. And so you would just throw it in, but it doesn't seem to, to sort of have a relationship. It, it has a tenuous relationship, but not a very strong one what's being discussed. And, and, that, and there are lots of terms like that. So I think that's what kind of what, maybe there's something else bothering me, but it's not strictly speaking, just the, the lexical side and the meaning and everything else. But, um, I want to say about the Chomsky thing. I mean, I, 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 I do. I am aware. Of, you know, oh, he was. Uh, he, uh, you had well, to see him in person yeah, in the seventies. Yeah. No, no, but I, 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 just, just kind of a an anecdotal thing was uh, somebody I knew who had, had worked with Chomsky and also been associated with uh, with generative grammar. Uh, talked about how in the early days, once the paradigm became dominant, that mm -hmm. if somebody were talking at a conference criticizing Chomsky, there would be Chomsky acolytes there. And they would collect the data and go back, and they would think of a strategy at the Absolutely. same conference to come back. And you know, so it's like this very kind of militant Chomskyism, and, and very well organized to make sure that uh, certain critiques uh, didn't go very far. I right? think you could always, you could in another talk, you might bring it up, or you know, somebody said this and this sort of thing. 
And um, so I am aware of that. And, and I, like I said, I, I, I don't like the scientific side of, of, of the Chomsky discourse when I, when I read things. But you know, it's interesting how he was the new paradigm. And it, what was it, the 1958, the Georgetown Linguistic Circle, where Chomsky made his name, first appeared. And apparently there were all these old structuralist linguists who were saying, who is this young upstart? You know, who does he think he is? And lo and behold, within just a few years, things had turned around and he was doing the same thing. Yeah, so it's kind of kind of interesting in that regard. But anyway, sorry. There's a question on the, on the chat, well, a raised hand, um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, ¿quieres intervenir con el micro? ¿Me oyes? Hola, Elizabeth. Hola, hola, perdona. Ah, vale, vale. Y Ana está pera igual. Dale, dale, que como justo te acababas de preguntar. Y me sí, había desaparecido mucho un momento. Ah, sí? Bueno, yo volví una confirmación, pero ahora si la había antes B eh, al David Block, eh, si la seva posición relació als Um, bueno, cambios de significado que puedan tener algunas, bueno, sí, algunas palabras o la ira de totas, como por ejemplo, el, bueno, el ejemplo que, que has donat sobre el golpe de Estado, ¿no? Lo pudeta. Uh, si lentes B, uh, y yo no estoy segura precisamente de, de haberlo en test B, uh, la teva explicación es uh, de orden marxista. La, la explicación sí. de la raó por la cual las palabras eh, cambian de sentido en función de quién parla. Eh, si tiene una explicación marxista. No sé si a uh, esta cuestión que has dicho ahora, de que las palabras cambian, la media visión de que las palabras cambian. Sí. No es aquí está, sí. Sí, eso es precisamente marxista, ¿no? yo diría. No, 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 no. La, la, el cambio no es marxista, pero el FED que. Uh, algunas palabras uh, o algún bueno el significado de, de algunas palabras acaba imposanza um, si te una no sé te a veura según tú um, uh, una explicación dordra marxista es el que no he acabado de entender no sé si ah, um, això es una buena pregunta habría dicho Podría pensar en una explicación o sea, política económica, ¿no? Para, para sí. qué pasa, ¿no? Yo creo que me sabía que este, no sé si yo creo que hay un otro Marx teórico que pudiera explicar yo y yo, uh, Marx teórico que pudieran contemplar el poder, ¿usted desde desde una óptica más de Foucault, por ejemplo, uh, de cómo funciona el poder en digamos agrupaciones, ¿no? Como serían los académicos. Y sí. quité la veo, quité veo a qué nivel y quité una veo un nivel más bajo y quité derecho impulsado en el sentido de una palabra en aquel caso y que no te encanta de él. Um, Eso es un mar, marxista. Uh, si estem mirando el marxismo a nivel de, de economía política, uh, a mí se me marca un, un, un otro nivel. No sé, habría de pensar yo precisamente en aquel, aquel caso. Uh, porque pasa por teorías de poder, de ideología, imagino que estás preguntando para eso. Sí. Pero, pero la, la verdad es que en aquel caso, um, realmente para, para explicar lo que sucede, podría ser más en el, digamos, en el, el mundo de Foucault a un otro tipo de, de análisis, creo. Una otra teoría de poder. De acuerdo. Bueno, ya en parlaré. Gracias. Sí, pero ya, ya, no, no, pero más de una, ya habría pensado. Tiene una buena, respuesta, una buena respuesta de aquí dos días. ¿no? Sí, ya tendría un correo. Gracias. Eh, vale, también un comentario al chat, que creo que nos pregunta, que es comentario, y también la privada más sacada. ¿Qué profe de estos? ¿Desde eso el comentario o al proyecto también aquí? De la Carmen Vicens. Carmen, si vos decís alguna cosa, pues manifestarla. Sí, me ha sembrado muy interesante, eh? pero yo también estoy con la Elizabeth, perdón. Eh, a mí me habría agradado, porque me sí, ha sorprendido ¿no? el término copertad y me ha sembrado que usted para un lexicógrafo es muy interesante, porque es claro, 
ja, per l'anisomorfisme no? que existeix. Vull dir, no és el mateix. Anglaterra no té una experiència històrica d'un cop d'estat, per això utilitza el, el terme en francès. No? Uh, I això ja per mi ja, pues, és sorprenent perquè dic, aquí hi ha l'anisomorfisme cultural, no? que és evident. Però, a més, en aquest cas també s'està estudiant dintre del que és l'àmbit jurídic. No? Eh, bueno, a l'exemple que s'ha posat. I bueno, pues m'ha semblat que també pues, caldria fer, potser aprofundir una mica més. M'ha semblat molt, no sé, m'ha sobtat, no? O sigui, m'ha semblat molt interessant, molt interessant. I potser d'aprofundir una miqueta més. Jo també estic amb la Verònica i, i també, pues, si dintre de dos dies, pues, pues no sé, no? S'ha pensat una altra cosa, pues que ens ho digués, perquè la veritat m'ha semblat pues, molt interessant i volia felicitar. No, una cosa, de, de, jo no soc expert en la història d'Anglaterra, però sí que em sembla que el Cromwell que va tenir un cop d'estat. Per tant, uh, jo crec que si aquesta paraula és així uh, en anglès, no hi ha una paraula anglosaxona, està més en el, perquè també tota la, tot el llenguatge polític ve dels, dels normandos, no? o sigui, de l'època que quin percentatge de l'anglès va acabar sent de reals francesos d'aquella època. No? Alguns diuen el 60%, perquè no la més així és difícil, però el menjar, per exemple, es veu en el menjar, es veu uh, sobretot en, en tot que sigui els discursos institucionals, la política, Uh, jo crec que més aviat la, la connexió és així, que, que existeix aquesta paraula culetà en anglès per això, però no perquè no, no hagi tingut un cop d'estat si mira un Cromwell. Però això és una petita... L'altra... Vale, pues, pues perfecte, sí, 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 pues molt interessant, perquè a mi no m'ho havien explicat així, no sé que és veritat. Sí, sí, perfecte, gràcies. No, és probablement l'única cosa que jo sé de la història de l'anglès. No, no, em sembla molt, molt interessant. Sí, sí, sí. Això l'explicava els alumnes quan anava a classes d'anglès. Com un farol, no? L'Elisabet Mis deia que ella no ho ha dit, però que també li ha semblat molt interessant la tornada i jo crec que era ella. Anava a dir en anglès, però ja que hem obert el multilingüisme i aquest, aquest hora que estic cansat, ho farem català. Eh, dos comentaris molt curts i, i una pregunta una mica que més. Com el primer comentari curt, una paraula que també jo tot el dia sento i penso que des d'aquesta perspectiva de ser molt interessant és fascis, feixisme. Perquè ara feixisme també es fa servir en un sentit que no té res a veure amb el que és el feixisme i és feixista tothom que pensa diferent que jo i expressa una opinió diferent a la meva. L'altre comentari així curt té a veure amb, amb el de la commodity i de la llengua. Jo és el primer cop que sento això i m'ha semblat molt interessant. Jo pensava, de fet, el que és una commodity no és la llengua, sinó conèixer una llengua determinada que és una llengua diferent de la teva. I és un saber especialitzat que és això el que és una comodit. És una saber especialitat que sí que té un preu, perquè són moltes hores d'aprenentatge eh, i, moltes hores de, i, i molts diners. I per tant, això sí que realment és un producte, un bé de servei, que tu has hagut de pagar per obtenir-lo, per obtenir el nivell d'anglès igual que tens un grau o un màster a determinada universitat. I jo crec que... De, de sí, però és curiós això, perquè no van en aquest sentit. I qui va en aquest sentit és tot el, el camp de, que es diu Economics of Language, no? que de François Green i gent a Suïssa, sobretot, però que, que són... Eh, François Green és, és el gran, és, 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 un, és economista, i es veu com un economista que mira qüestions de, de llengua en societat. I ell, ell intenta... Uh, per exemple, ell mira el trilingüisme, per exemple, a Suïssa, entre alemany i francès i italià, per exemple, acaben tres idiomes, no? Eh, quin rèdit, o sigui, què, què, què treus si, si tu saps els tres idiomes dos en el, en el món del treball? I va mirar els sous i aquestes coses, i va com una anàlisi econòmica. Um, I ell és molt crític, també, amb la gent que fa servir commodity, però és una òptica d'economia de, de uh, teòrica, no? D'economista de, de i no d'economia política, que, que també es pot marcar una diferència. Uh, 
Per tant, és, és, és en aquest camp que realment hi ha gent mirant això. Jo no he vist referències. He vist referències a gent dient això, potser, com, com sí, és interessant mirar. Però el que és, és fan és més... Uh, uh, bueno, Monica Hellerstein té, té aquesta distinció interessant entre pride i profit. I és una mica la distinció entre l'idioma uh, pel poble, per, per, com un idioma, l'idioma és una... És una o sigui, marca la identitat, aquestes coses. Eh, I després també, o en un moment passa a tenir algun valor econòmic a nivell de que pots aconseguir una feina, no pots aconseguir una feina, més aviat no tens la llengua. Com que ja mirar molt la situació de francès de Canadà, no només a Quebec, sinó a Ontario o a altres llocs, eh, doncs li interessa això. No? I hi ha gent que a Catalunya, que també els van pujolar, i altres gent que també han publicat amb ella i han mirat pujolar, han mirat el turisme, per exemple. I jo, jo trobo tot això, és el que dic, jo trobo molt interessant aquestes, aquestes uh, recerques, però de vegades penso que podien utilitzar un altre llenguatge. No? És a dir, és a dir, uh, i hi ha gent que, que utilitzen commodity o commodification per dir un skill set. Jo crec que skill set és l'única uh, de què estem parlant aquí, que, que, que skill set és definit pels, pels que donen feina. No? És a dir, tu, tu, tu vols uh, sol·licitar una feina i diuen no te necessiten i està inclòs això. Però des d'òptica marxista, o sigui, la gran cosa és que com és el labor power, no? Com pots separar el que és l'ús de l'idioma amb també una altra cosa que és pensar, raonar, uh, o a millor fer una cosa amb les mans a l'hora. Per exemple, la gent al call center estan teclejant, estan parlant per telèfon, tenen un guió que estan llegint. Aleshores, és tot el paquet i el labor power que és aporten a aquesta feina o sigui, tot això està contingut en això, no? I, i aleshores és molt difícil, no? Què, què, què és el valor de, de, de l'anglès utilitzat en aquest context? Au, però ficat enmig d'aquestes altres estreses, no? I, i això, això és el problema. El que passa és que, com he dit, és que al final, eh, com he dit, és, són investigacions, són una recerca molt interessant eh, i em puc quedar amb això i no criticar això. De fet, ja no critico. No dic res. Jo només dic la pregunta i jo utilitzo aquesta paraula. No utilitzo aquesta paraula, jo, jo dic una altra cosa. Però ara tinc una... participaré en una mena de panel d'aquí una setmana i estarem parlant d'això. I que, ah, no sé. Jo faré referència a les meves crítiques, però no penso... No tinc ganes de ja discutir o de discutir això, no? Però, però és una... no sé. És... És, 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 no, es troba massa complicat, no? Una mica, que no, no hi ha una manera molt més senzilla, però tornant al tema d'això, de, de que tu has dit al principi, que això de que la gent està moltes hores, la seva vida estudiant, molt d'esforç, diners, i tot, doncs serien... És que aquesta gent no està mirant això, està mirant altres coses. Sí. I l'última era... Té que veure amb l'última pregunta, que és... La, la perspectiva de l'exicògraf que, que pensa en, en diccionaris, mm. que és um, fins a quin punt... O sigui, els diccionaris recullen els significats de les paraules quan ja estan consolidats en l'ús. Eh, I llavors, fins a quin punt... Eh, la, la dificultat que, que hi ha en l'ús d'això, de, de, de d'aquestes paraules que hem fet servir, no? del cop d'estar... Eh, Clar, fins a quin punt es pot dir que això està consolidat en l'ús per introduir-ho en el diccionari? I quan s'introdueix en el diccionari, com s'introdueix la informació pragmàtica de això es fa servir com a crítica? I és, vull dir, que la reflexió per mi, que era molt interessant, des del punt de vista lexicògraf, és fins a quin punt aquests usos, que estan socialment molt estesos, però estan realment consolidats, o, o són modes passatgeres que d'aquí a cinc anys ningú parlarà de cop d'estat i, per tant, el diccionari no ens ha de recollir. I si el recull, fins a quin punt la descripció que fas és neutra dient cop d'estat, eh, intent de canviar el sistema del govern, o segons els que no estan d'acord amb aquest, eh, és un sistema de canviar el govern. I aquesta és la part que és realment interessant des del punt de vista geogràfic perquè et posa davant d'una dificultat real, que aquí és un cas molt extrem, però que moltes vegades no. tens en moltes paraules. Però jo estava pensant que, precisament en aquest cas, que sortien allà uns quants periodistes, no? a partir de Cruz Santo, i tots aquests que, que realment tenen unes plataformes que arriben a molta gent i que, per tant, és això, no? l'ús s'estén. Clar, 
És allò que ens trobem amb el projecte. Aleshores, tu tens detectat uns usos d'unes paraules o d'uns sintomes, el que sigui, que s'estan utilitzant amb un significat que no és el que recull el diccionari. Aleshores, l'hem de marcar tan ideològicament o simplement és una extensió de l'ús? Des del punt de vista lexicogràfic, no hi hauria d'haver biologia en aquest sentit, no? Però precisament amb coses de política o coses relacionades amb la societat en general, aquests fets enciclopèdics sempre han estat, sempre des de punts de vista diferents, hi ha el mateix esdeveniment, però hi ha nomenclatura diferent. No me n'oblidaré mai de la vida. En una visita a Londres, jo de Washington, D.C., visitant el Parlament Britànic, començaven a parlar de del que en Estats Units és el rei tonto de la història d'Anglaterra, que és George III, perquè va perdre les colònies, que era el que anava a ser Estats Units. I van començar a parlar, i aquesta nomenclatura es coneix, Estats Units, però deien The War of Independence. Janet, you mean the Revolutionary War. És que, a veure, si ets Estats Units, això és un Revolutionary War. Parlen a Anglaterra, o a Gran Bretanya en general, parlen de la guerra de 1812 que van envair Washington en els Estats Units. This is the war of 1812. We were invaded. Doncs no, això és part de les guerres napoleòniques, the Napoleonic Wars. I això no només amb guia turística, sinó en llibres d'història seriosos. De manera que el que diu Sergi, que com determina si això es queda amb l'ús, suposo que s'ha d'esperar. Tu estàs parlant amb una que li va dir a un cubà i això es va perdre. Ja. Sí, tot bé que estigui de perdre és una cita. Si la frase és més es va perdre a cubà, el problema és nota en el diccionari. No li ho diguis cubà. Però la frase hi és. I el primer problema és... Passa el mateix amb el llenguatge religiós. Abans tu miraves una definició d'un terme catòlic i et deien te l'explicaven. I ara et diuen, en la Iglesia Catòlica, com a... I te l'expliquen. Perquè s'assumia que tothom era catòlic i, per tant, no calia especificar que això era un ús dintre dels catòlics i ara s'ha d'afegir en la Iglesia Catòlica perquè ara s'assumeix que no tothom és catòlic. I a mi aquí em passava el mateix. O sigui, quan tu dius golpe d'estado, si això es consolida, ho haurem de definir com intent de derrocar el poder establert per una via que no és un cop d'estat tradicional. No necessàriament amb violència. Sense violència i amb un... Això que es fa servir si cop d'estat. Li hem d'afegir el començament segons els polítics conservadors o no? Perquè, clar, és que això és un ús que fan servir els polítics conservadors. Els altres no consideren que sigui un cop d'estat. Els conservadors espanyols. Sí, sí, els conservadors espanyols. Els catalans, que també n'hi ha... I llavors, és aquest tipus d'informació que descriure el significat de la paraula necessàriament vol dir descriure les condicions d'ús d'aquesta paraula. I això és el que és molt difícil i aquesta... Gràcies per la xerrada, perquè aquesta xerrada t'ha fet pensar en aquest tipus de restriccions que són culturals i pragmàtiques i que estan darrere d'usos de paraules, que és que aquest ús està extès. O sigui, cop d'estat per aquella gent és això. Igual que, vull dir, amb els termes que tenen molta connotació política per això mateix, igual que pres polític, en l'altra banda, pres polític no és això, és una altra cosa, però aquí pres polític és això. Refugiat, que té una definició, m'ha fet molta gràcia veure Jeffrey Williams, que és molt amic nostre del nostre grup. Jeffrey Williams i jo vàrem fer un treball fa uns anys per la... Almenys un encert. Sí, no, no, més d'un. Crec que puc parlar en nom de tots, més d'un. Per examinar l'ús de la paraula refugiat, perquè des de... Crec que és 1956, les Nacions Unides, hi ha una definició bastant oficial, estipulada, que és refugiat, que és un displaced person, com que ara n'hi haurà 
desgraciadamente, a Shell torna a passar a Europa, uh, e elas horas, porque os refugiados têm uh, diversos direitos, um direito internacional, que não têm pessoas dispostas. Uhum. Elas horas te, podem ter consequências. O que passa é que, como as muito bem comentar, em luz, em, em, Molts mitjans de comunicació, que la, aquesta terminologia surt, però no amb aquesta una definició específica de, de rigor, com si diguéssim. Però, i després també em feia pensar en, en la correcció política cultural en la qual vivim, que també ara ja no es parla d'immigrants o de migrants, ara simplement són migrants. Sí. No? Mm -hmm. però, i, i, i això és, també és molt recent. Dir, no sé què, que també hi ha uns canvis. Allò. Ara això no en diguem així diguem-ne d'una altra manera, per, perquè suposadament és, un, és una manera més amable de referir-se a segons què, doncs clar, això també afecta després el diccionari. Què ho poses? Perquè al capdavall, segons com és una mica condescendent, condescendentment es diu de la persona que. Clar, no posaràs això en el diccionari, però al, al, al rerefons no hi ha una mica d'això? No sé. Sí, sí. Jo he trobat molt interessant la diapositiva que que hi havia els key ideas i que hi havia has dit que hi havia massa paraules no, sí hi havia que hi havia massa text ja sé, espera ah, no, no, no la meva pregunta no és pregunta metodològicament com determines això? és un estudi perquè Segur que ho coneixes, però que hi ha uh, programes informàtics que ho pots posar, uh, d'això que, dan, que donen um, mutual, mutual contextual information. Uh, fa servir, en el teu cas, fa servir una metodologia basada en l'estadística o en la impressionística o una combinació de totes dues? Jo, jo crec que jo no he treballat mai directament a focus linguístics, no? Mm -hmm. de i això. Um, segur eh, afegiria una dimensió útil aquí. Però sí que jo estic més en el món i m'agrada buscar el que dic, episodis o esdevinaments o fins i tot un, un discurs, un discurs que podria analitzar amb l'argument que, que algú pot dir, bueno, això només va passar una vegada, però aquest discurs està construït yeah. No, no, no està dient el polític això aleatòriament, l'està inventant en el moment, sinó hi ha una intertextualitat total, contínua, i si està utilitzant referències determinades és perquè existeixen, diguem, alter, no? que està en circulació. Per tant, amb aquesta, aquesta òptica, um, pues, i, i en general sempre no he treballat amb diguem, metodologies quantitatives, però reconec que en aquest cas, per exemple, tu vols optimism, buscar si ja, ja tens tot un full amb, amb tot que ve d'abans i després i les provocacions i estadística. A més, un programa que ja tinc per tot. Eh? Uh, no, no descartaria fer això, però sí de, de moment uh, que havia fet aquesta proposta de recerca era de, que vaig fer amb la Carla, la, la Carla Tilfo, uh, Tilfo i que, que ja, ja, ja és una, una, un intent de mirar populis, o sigui, com viu la paraula populista o populista, que sigui, com viu en cinc episodis i d'activitats. I un és el cas de Ciutadans, un altre cas és la Díaz Ayuso. O sigui, mirar, mirar com cinc casos i aleshores això, i no descartaria en fer aquests estudis per si incorporar un element de cobres. Però hauria de contractar a un investigador que sàpiga fer això, no? perquè és el que no treballa en això. Però sí que aquí uh, és interessant perquè afegeix un, un angle quantitatiu interessant que després pots compaginar, tothom parla de mixed methods i aquestes coses, però aquí tens un exemple que realment pot funcionar molt bé, molt bé. però no ho he fet fins ara. I, i moltes coses que he fet són més discurs, o sigui, són, són treballs discursius, no? com un argument, i, i això no, no són exactament investigacions. No? Però, però sí, aquest projecte seria investigacions quasi etnogràfiques sobre aquests 
són els cinc casos de populisme, com viu en el món, no? Però no sé, no crec que ens doni un projecte és molt difícil de petició, però redactant el projecte sí que vaig arribar a aclarir-lo una mica i és un projecte que volia fer com el que hem de fer, perquè depèn de moltes coses de social media, dels diaris, sobretot dels mitjans de comunicació, per construir el cas. Ciutadans, per exemple, vols fer la història de Ciutadans allà per tots els tres anys. Allà tens molts exemples de punts importants, no?, en el desenvolupament, en el rise and fall, no?, en el sentit així. Thank you. Very, very much. Moltes gràcies, crec que ha estat interessant per tots nosaltres, ens ha fet reflexionar molts temes que ens toquen molt a prop i espero que no sigui l'última vegada que ens vinguis a parlar amb el nostre grup. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.